In the book of James chapter 4, James is explaining to us how to heal contentious relationships. You know that because he starts the chapter by talking about quarrels and fights. He has quite a few things to say about it. In verses 1 through 2, he describes the cause and the pattern of strife. What is strife? Well, it's just, you know, it's fighting. It's quarrels. It's nasty uh, knock down drag outs. It's harsh words. And he explains in verses 1 through 2 where that comes from. He asks the question, where do these things come from? And then he explains it's your, your desires that you don't uh, find that your desires are being met. And so you cause strife. You fight to get what you want. And then he so graciously in 2 through 3 describes why we lack the things we want. It's because we have problems with God and prayer in particular. We either don't pray, verse, the very large, last part of verse 2, and therefore we don't seek God as our answer, the provider of our needs. Or if we do pray, verse 3, we are praying with wrong motives. <laughs> we, either don't, we, don't, we either don't treat God as our provider, we don't pray at all, or when we do pray, we're really putting ourselves first, not putting God first. You can see what he's doing there. He's explaining, all right, do you want to know why you lack? You're causing trouble, causing fights because you lack. And let's talk about why you lack first before we correct the idolatry problem that you have. It's so gracious for him to do that. And then he addresses the idolatry, verse 4. You adulterous people, spiritually adulterous, of course. So he confronts us as sinners. He says, we're friends of the world, verse 4. An enemy of God. Verse 4, he explains that this is exactly what the Old Testament scriptures say about us, that God yearns jealously over the spirit that he's made to dwell in us. There's something in us that wants to go astray, and God yearns jealously over that. Or that could mean that that statement there, uh, which is a summary of Old Testament teaching, could be referring to the fact that our desires yearn jealously against God, our lusts want to go against God. Both those truths are complementary. And so, he's basically confronting us as sinners here in verses 4 through 5 before he finally gets to the solution in verse 6. But God gives more grace. Thank God. The solution to sin and strife is God's empowering, sanctifying grace in our lives that God gives. That is such good news. Remember we said a minute ago that the secret to enjoying God and worshiping God and glorifying God and praising God is simply to look upon statements like that like we would look upon something beautiful in nature and respond. Uh, here's another one. We've already talked about how God is the kind of God who cares about the single lost sheep and goes after it to save it from itself and save it from the wolfish enemies that might kill it and devour it. Um, here we see another thing about God, that God's generous with empowering grace to help people um, overcome sin. See, that's huge. A major part of being able to have victory over sin is just reaching out and embracing that truth and believing it and putting all of your eggs in that one basket, so to speak. This is why David in Psalm 51 cries out to God, create in me a clean heart, O God. That very prayer is about as Calvinistic as anything can possibly be. It just is. Because he's literally asking God to make him clean inside. He's not assuming he can do it himself. In fact, just the very prayer itself is a, a repudiation of, of self-reformation. That prayer is a repudiation of Pelagianism, which says, just repent and God will accept you. You can do it on your own. You have it in you to do it. No. That prayer is, Lord, I don't have it in me to do it, so you have to do it in me. I'm calling out to you, creating me a clean heart. The, in, anytime somebody prays that with, with, tr with true desire and longing, God's already been at work. He's already been at work to get a person to pray that with true desire and longing. It's such a thrill to recognize that. It's such a beautiful thing to see that God gives more grace. See that there? He just keeps giving it. He keeps giving, he keeps giving, he keeps giving. Do you feel the need for it continually? 
Oh, that means he's been working on you too. And so he comes to the solution of verse 6 and tells you that the solution to sin and strife in your life is that God gives more grace. That's why the Old Testament says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Proverbs chapter 3. And so when you get to verse 7, which is where we are, he basically tells you how to respond to this good news that God is generous with grace. Remember I said a minute ago, a big part of responding to God and loving God is just simply reacting to the truth about Him with joy and, and gratitude and worship. Well, how does one respond to this idea that God is just generous with help to empower you against sin? How do you respond to that truth? That's what 7 and 8 is designed to do. It gives you seven features of a proper response to the truth that God is gracious with assistance and empowerment against sin. Okay, in other words, really, verses 7 through 8 is simply asking a question. That is, okay, God is gracious. That's who God is. God is not standing up in the heavens with His arms crossed going, you scumbag. Don't ever think that you're going to come to me for help. That is not who He is at all. God yearns to help. But He doesn't help who? What does the passage say He doesn't help? He resists who? Proud people. That is who God is. Our world is filled with proud people who aren't going to get a lick of thing from, things from God because He simply will not help them. He will not help proud people. So what does it mean then to come to God humbly? Because if that's the key, that if I come to God humbly, He's going to help me, then what does it mean to come to God humbly? 7 through 8 is the answer to that question. There's seven discrete, identifiable ideas in those two verses. He tells you how to come to God humbly in humble repentance. We looked last time at the first one. Look at verse uh, 7 again. It says, submit yourselves therefore to God. Okay, there's your first one. Okay, if you want the seven, let me give them to you really quickly. The seven points from these two verses about how to come, come to God humbly and not proudly, how to get God to help you, not resist you. You ever feel like sometimes you're beating your head against a wall in life, like there's a brick wall, and you're just pounding your head against it. You can't get empowerment. You don't feel like God's listening to you. You feel like there's something between you and God, and you're not getting power over sin, and you just feel like God's resisting you. Maybe He is. He resists the proud. Well, what do I do to humble myself? Seven through eight. 7 through 8 answers that question. Number one, submit yourself to God. Number two, resist the devil. Number three, draw near to God. Number four, cleanse your hands. Number five, purify your hearts. Number six, be wretched and mourn and weep. And number seven, stop laughing and start crying. Wow. That's incredible. Let's get into each one in turn, shall we? So number one, submit yourselves to God. We talked about that quite a bit last time, so I'm not going to go into it in any depth at this point because we had an entire sermon on it last time. If you want to go back and find that sermon and listen to it, um, I hope it will be helpful to you. But it goes on and talks about, secondly, resisting the devil. Resisting the devil is the flip side to submitting to God, okay? If somebody says, oh yeah, I'm submitting to God, but they're still fraternizing with the enemy, have they really submitted to God? No way. In other words, resisting the devil is the flip side to submitting to God. If we truly submit to God, then we are by nature resisting God's enemy, the devil. And that implies something about sin, doesn't it? If you have to submit, to, to, to come to God humbly means you have to submit to God and you have to start resisting the devil. That implies that you were not resisting the devil before, but you were what? Whoa, that's heavy. Is your life full of strife and contention? If the answer to that is yes... And let's, let's, stop and, and let's stop thinking about strife just for a second, because the passage is about strife, but let's just say sin. Is your life filled with sin? Okay. Then you've been fellowshipping with the devil. A guy recently died who wrote a song called Running with the Devil. Now he's dead. 
Well, everybody loved that song in 1984. I know because I was 14, barely conscious at the, that moment in my life. Oh, everybody loved that song. Everywhere you went, you heard that song blaring out of car windows that revved their motors when they drove by. He's dead. People think of people like that as immortal. They're not. The devil's been living. If you've been living in sin or strife, face it. The devil has been living in your midst, throwing a party, and you've been in the midst of the party. And you know, I think it's hard to think that causing strife is a surrender to the devil. But Paul clearly exp explains something. Paul clearly explains that each Christian, every one of you and me, we all struggle against, quote, the wiles of the devil and against principalities and powers. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 12 tells us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age. We struggle against the plots and schemes and plans of the devil as he tries to do exactly what he was doing to Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, tempt us and get us to go astray. And so it's inevitable that Christians will do wrong and fall into sin because we have an enemy that is trying to get us to, and we're not glorified yet. We're not in a solidified state yet. We still can fall, and so we do. The key thing that, that James is trying to get us to accept is that when we do, we are literally fraternizing with God's enemy, and we need to see it that way. We need to see it as the betrayal that it is. That's why he said earlier, you adulterous people, okay? Basically, an adulterer is what? Somebody who breaks covenant with the person they should be with and is with somebody else. Well, if you're an adulterous person against God, well, then who's the somebody else? The devil. If anything will wake you up to your condition, this will. If anything will, accepting the fact that you are constantly being woo wooed by the enemy of your Savior. That will wake you up to your perilous condition. When you sinned, you were a child of God. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, remember, he's writing to Christians in this passage. He's saying these things. You adulterous people, you're fraternizing with the devil. He's saying these things to Christian people. So, you're a child of God, but when you sinned, you fell temporarily into the ways of the devil. And he's saying, I mean, look at, look at chapter 3, verse 15. Just look, if, if you're wondering, is he really, I mean, are these really the implications of it? Look back at chapter 3, verse 15. He says to Christian people again here, um, when you look at verse 14, if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, don't boast and be false to the truth. This, that is this sin that I'm talking about, is not the wisdom that comes from heaven, but it's earthly, unspiritual, and what? Demonic. See, I'm not jumping off the, into the deep end in any way, shape, or form. This is exactly what James is saying. And so I think it's important, if you want to have true conviction of sin, to recognize that when you fall into sin, that you temporarily, in that moment, took off God's jersey and put on the devil's jersey. So what do you do when you recognize this, when this really hits you? Oh, my word, are, we, are these really the stakes? Yes, they're the stakes. So what do I do then? Well, number one, resist the devil. <laughs> That's exactly what he's saying here. Stop fraternizing with the enemy. Stop groveling before him. Give the devil a, quote, Dear John letter. And believe what he promises here. James says, he assures us that if we truly submit to God and resist the devil, what, what, will the, what, what will the devil do? He will flee from you. Resist the devil and he will flee from you, verse 7. And also, so number one, you need to resist the devil. Number two, you need to really believe the promise that's there. There's another promise. Do you see the splash of red on that promise? Or the, maybe the splash of orange and the fall colors of that promise? Are they striking your optic nerve, your spiritual optic nerve? 
Do you realize what God's promising you there? He says, if you accept the power of my spirit to fill you and you resist the enemy, he will run away. That's a beautiful splash of color. And thirdly, another application here is be amazed that God has mercy on sinners like us. When you really recognize that you are struggling with that kind of sin, betrayal type sin, and then recognize that he gives more grace to people like me, that's me, oh, God loves me? Exactly. You're not far from the kingdom of God when you feel those feelings. And I just don't think you've ever entered it until you do feel those sorts of feelings. We can be assured that His grace is on the way to us when that is how we're responding. But how can we expect grace when we're cozying up to His enemy, right? So resist the devil. Thirdly, draw near to God. Draw near to God. See, that's what he says next. Remember the first three? What are the first three points here? Number one, submit to God. Number two, resist the devil. And then number three, draw near to God. Verse eight, draw near to God. Now, this assumes that when we fell into sin and strife, we did what? So he's saying, draw near to him. That assumes when we fell into strife, we did what? Wandered away from him. Do you see how each one of these is a word picture? Each one of these is a word picture. Let's pick up all three word pictures in just a bundle real quick here, okay? Here they all are. Submit to God. That assumes when you sinned, you did what? Submit to God. There's the first one. That assumes, that assumes, it presupposes that when you sinned, you did what? Rebelled. Resist the devil. That assumes or presupposes that when you sinned, you did what? Surrendered. To the devil. You know, I heard somebody give an illustration about sin once and temptation that is so grotesque that I'm almost not ready to repeat it, but I think I will. This is a perfect time to repeat it. So here's the story, okay? Can you picture this? We're, we're, I'm using a lot of fall imagery because I love fall and I love the colors of fall. So imagine, imagine a fair young maiden um, in the woods, and it's like a, maybe a medieval setting. There's a castle on a hill. And she's, you know, enjoying the day. It's a beautiful day. And she's dressed in long robes. She's like a, an elf from Tolkien or something. And there's like a, a halo about her, you know, like there always is in those shows. But um, so, you know, something beautiful, something, some kind of beautiful sylvan kind of setting. Beautiful girl, beautiful clothes, beautiful day, sunshine. Uh, all the leaves are beautiful. And she sits down by a river or by a, a stream. And um, out from behind a rock crawls a awful, you know, saucer-plated size, uh, big plate-sized tarantula. And it just kind of perches there. And she sees it. What do you expect her to do? She doesn't run. She doesn't even scream. She looks at it as though she likes it. It crawls up on her foot and perches there. She starts to pet it crawls up her leg and rests on her chest. She starts to kiss it. It crawls onto her face, latches on. She's still kissing it. It begins to devour her. She still kisses it. She has surrendered to evil and foulness and grotesqueness. And she has no idea that it's destroying her. See, that's a disgusting story, isn't it? Exactly. It's a disgusting story when we surrender to evil. See, these are word pictures. When we sin, we rise up in rebellion against God. When we sin, we surrender to evil. And when we sin, we wander from God and must return. Now, I want to deal with a theological issue here. I'm not sure I've got the time to do it. But take a look at it here. Um, James chapter 4, verse 8. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. I think I'm going to summarize this, um, do my best to summarize it here. And I don't want to 
to, to develop this too much because we need to take communion today. And I'm really looking forward to doing that. I think after talking about sin, this is a perfect opportunity to take communion and get right with God if we need to. I know we all, to some degree, need to. Um, is James saying, let me just try to summarize this the best I possibly can in a short space of time here. When he says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you, is he saying that, you know, I think somebody could read those words and could maybe jump to a wrong conclusion, think that maybe when we sinned, you know, James is describing sin so graphically here as a surrender to the devil and as a, almost like an apostasy, a wandering from God, that's like an apostasy. Is he saying that Christians can lose their salvation and then they need to get saved all over again? Okay. Is that what he's saying? I want to deal with that question just real briefly. Number one, true Christians cannot lose their salvation. Okay. True Christians cannot lose their salvation. 1 John 2, 19. Now, people do apostatize, but true Christians can't truly and finally fall away from God. 1 John 2, 19, 2, 19 describes apostates and says, they went out from us that it might be known that they were not of us. 1 John 2, 19. In other words, people, people who apostatize are showing, showing that they never were truly Christians. And true believers in Christ can never fall away and perish. That's exactly what Jesus says in John 10, verse 28. My sheep shall never perish, he says. That is as clear as anything can possibly be. But Christians can and do backslide and wander from God. And that's what he's talking about here. He's not talking about apostasy, though he is describing it in terms that are so extreme, like, you know, surrendering to the devil and stuff like that, that is admittedly extreme. But he's, he's trying to get to show kind of jaded, hard-hearted Christian people what they're doing when they fall into sin. That's what he's trying to do. He's trying to get people to be sensitive to the sins we fall into. That's his goal. And God never wandered from us either. You might assume that by, by the wording. Look at the wording again. You might, when you read this... Um, draw near to God, and then he will draw near to you. That, see, that sounds like, that could be interpreted almost as a, okay, God will love me if I can get myself cleaned up enough to come to him. So if I come to him, then he will come to me. In other words, it almost sounds like God has is, is like rejected us and, and turned his back on us. And then if we, if we just get right, then he'll turn to face us again. And that would, I think, would be a mistake to understand it that way. See, the thing about it is that God says things like this in the Bible. He says, surely goodness and mercy will follow me a few of the days of my life as long as I do this and that and this and that and repent. Just right then, surely goodness and mercy will follow me. No, surely goodness and, follow, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. That includes when? When I wander from him and when I surrender to the devil. But we still wander when we sin. So did, God didn't leave us, but it still says that if we return, then he'll return to us, right? It still says that, right? It does. So it does seem like God has distanced himself from us in some way, right, when we sin. What I'm saying is, is that those wonderful promises like Psalm 23 are not defunct simply because you fell into sin. It's not as though you need to get right, uh, you know, get right and be saved all over again. You need to get right, but you don't need to be saved all over again. So how are we to interpret this then? How do we to understand, okay, if I draw near to God, then he will come back to me. Wait a second, that sounds scary. It seems like he's distanced himself. Well, I think the way to understand this is chastening. God does chasten his people. And it's a sign of his fatherly care. When God chastens us, he can seem distant, right? Listen to this verse from the Old Testament. Quote, so this is Psalm 10, verse 1. The psalmist cries out to God and says, Oh, Lord, why do you stand afar off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Psalm 10, verse 1. And Psalm 66, 18 connects sin with this experience, which some of you have had. Have you ever had dark nights of the soul where it seemed like God was as far away from you as could possibly be? You bet. You bet you've had that experience. 
Well, listen to this, Psalm 66, 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. But is this his rejection? Is, so he does fade away. His presence isn't palpable like it used to be. You feel like you're beating your head against the wall. You feel like God's resisting me. He's not listening to me. He's far off from me. Why do you stand afar off? But this is fatherly discipline, not judgment and damnation. That is the key thing to recognize. This is God not, is, he's not rejecting you. He's trying to bring you to repentance. He's trying to soften your heart. He's trying to get you to feel what it's like to not have him and to start treasuring his presence more. Is that not what we need to learn? Is it, is it not true that we need to learn to really treasure his presence so that it's a, de, a delight to turn off Netflix and open up our Bible? Isn't that what we need? Isn't it, isn't it true that we need to become better lovers of God? That is, we simply delight to see beautiful things about him. And the thing we are most passionate about is to be able to read about him. That's what, that's what God, God wants us to be, you know, longing for Him, setting our, our minds on things above, not on things on the earth. Where Christ sits at the right hand of God, that's where our heart needs to be. Our hearts need to be hidden with Christ in God. Colossians chapter 3 describes it. That's the kind of people we need to be. And we're not. C.S. Lewis used to say that we're like people who'd rather sit. And, no, actually, this was John Piper. John P Piper uh, li liked to say that we're like people who like to sit and make mud pies when we we've been invited to, to go see the Alps. No, I don't want to go see the Alps. I'm too busy with my mud pies. I'm sitting in my mud puddle. You know, That's who we are. And so God sometimes removes some blessings, not because he wants to take them away permanently, but because he wants to fill our hands with much greater blessings himself. So he's telling us that if we want, James is telling us that if we want God to return in full blessing, if we want God to return and hear us and answer our prayers, if we want God to return and fill us with his spirit once more for empowerment, then we must turn from our wandering and come back to him. Calvin, John Calvin said, God is never wanting to us except when we alienate ourselves from him. God is never wanting to us except when we alienate ourselves from him. And it's, I think what we're learning from James 4 is, is it easy to alienate ourselves from God? Immensely easy. It's the easiest thing in the world, being children of Adam and still having the flesh. Just remember, we need to start thinking of it as a rebellious uprising, a surrender to foul evil, the devil and a wandering away from God. Praise God if you're repentant, and that's where we need to end right now. If you sense in your own heart a desire for repentance and a longing to flee to Him, rejoice and be exceedingly glad because you would not have any longing in your heart to flee to the Lord Jesus Christ except that the Holy Spirit has been at work in your life. If you are looking at your life right now and thinking, okay, I'm a wretch and I don't, I don't hate my sin enough, then pray with David, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and renew a right spirit within me. That's what you need to do. You, you need to depend on God for your repentance. You need to ask God to do the work in your heart to make it clean, because you can't. If you find yourself longing for God, rejoice and be exceedingly glad because the Spirit's at work. If you find yourself self-critiquing your own repentance, then pray with David, create in me a clean heart, O God. And be, with, be like Jacob who wouldn't let the angel go until...
he blessed him. And God will save you and clean you up. Not perfectly in this life, of course, but substantially, and you'll have that hope of heaven. Now, we're going to take communion here in a minute. Let me just remind us how we're going to do it. But the main thing is when we take communion is you need to take it as a believer in Christ, full faith, not in the elements, but in what they symbolize. Remember, the little bit of, of um, bread and the little bit of grape juice symbolizes Christ's broken body and shed blood, his atonement for you. So you need to be putting your faith in the atonement, Christ's work on the cross, okay? Recognizing these are just symbols and letting the symbols preach to you what it all supposed to mean. And ingesting it symbolizes what? What does ingesting those things symbolize? If you know anything about church history, you'll realize that for hundreds of years, people argued and stuff about, does this mean that you're literally tasting the literal body? I mean, I mean, it's ridiculous, the things that people have had to argue about for hundreds of years. Um, when Jesus himself tells you in John 6 what it all symbolizes, he puts the eating the, eating the flesh and the believing the, the truth right next to each other within t- the space of two verses. If you read that chapter, you'll see he defines eating the flesh right there in the context. It's believing the gospel. So when you take this, you need to refresh your faith. It's like hitting refresh on your faith. That's what you're doing. You're refreshing your faith in the gospel and the shed blood of Christ. And trusting in him all over again. Not that you're getting saved all over again, but you're just refreshing your faith. And um, because if you don't have an atonement, then what do you have from God? If God isn't at peace with you because of Christ's atonement, then what is he? At war with you because of all your foulness. So, once more, rejoice that he is at peace with you because of the death of his son. Now, and your faith, you're believing in that death. So, you need to take it as a believer. You need to take it also as somebody who's willing to examine yourself to see if sin has encroached. And be willing to get rid of it by the power of the Spirit of God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded, as you take communion today. May the Lord bless you as you do that. Yeah.